Today we are here with Dr. Luke Hanley. Uh, he is an AVS uh, fellow, um, which is the American Vacuum Society, and so we welcome him for this question and answer session, and we really thank you for being here. Oh, thank you. So, would we like to open it up for questions? Do you have any mentorship or teaching philosophies that guide your interactions with students? Um, I always feel that actual hands-on experience is very important in science. I've always been an experimental scientist, um, and or now I'm an advisor that advises experimental scientists because I don't actually touch anything because who knows what would happen if I did. But uh, um, and I so I. That's carried me through both undergraduate classes where I spent a lot of time in my early years at the university developing laboratories to when I was department head where I funded the development of laboratories and encouraged faculty and staff to get together and improve them because that's often kind of an arduous task compared to just improving a lecture. And in my own laboratory, I feel very strongly that students, even if there's an experiment they can do that um, is already you know kind of prepackaged to work, that they need to get some sort of personal experience and, and some specific skill. So maybe one person will get, I'll say you have to learn how to do optics. Another person, maybe you have to focus on vacuum hardware and so forth. So it's, e I mean, even when you think about when you take a class, you know, the instructor can stand up there and write a bunch of equations on the board, but you don't really get it until you work through them yourself or you work through the problems and so forth. And I think that's also a big issue with beginning students when they come to university and they want to be in science and engineering is they don't quite understand that, that they think if they sit in the class or they watch videos of it and they kind of understand what's going on that they're going to do well in the class. It's like, no, you have to be able to solve the problems. That's what the exams are. So, um, so analytical chemistry and instru instrumental analysis have existed for at least two centuries. How do you find and stay on the cutting edge uh, in the field? I spend a lot of time reading the literature. Um, I spend a lot of time trying to see what the new technologies are out there. So we, uh, a lot of what I've done has been focusing on using lasers and mass spectrometry, and so I'm often trying to keep up with what the new laser technologies are out there, because there's, there's a big laser and optics industry, and so they create opportunities. So we, you know, we build our own instruments, but really what that means is we, we buy different subset technologies and we put them together and it not there are not so many that we build up ourselves from scratch so that's one way the other is of course reading the literature and trying to really have a critical eye towards what the thing that that i can do and my students can do and the rest of the people in my group can do how that really competes with other technologies out there, which is sometimes a little uh, dispiriting, right? Because you think you can do something one way and then there's a whole community of people out there and they come up and they do it the completely different way and then you have to sort of accept that, you know, that, that now it's time to go in a different direction or something. I remember hearing a very talented scientist once uh, talk about how, you know, we develop these new technologies and then once the biologists get good at it, we have to move on, you know, and that's, um, it's not, uh, but some methods are just inherently hard. They never kind of reach large scale. I mean, if there's enough incentive for a company to kind of create that easy to do workflow, then that will happen, but sometimes it doesn't. Um, it, you also have to think about what are the related trends, right? And what are the, you know, where the you know, kind of fields and you know, sometimes society is going. So one, uh, one issue is what's fundable, right? I mean, you know, we, we are an expensive business, you know, so we need someone, they're very, very, I've only heard of one person in all my years that actually self-funded. I think he had a good stock investment and he started self-funding himself. But um, generally, I think that, you know, you have to have a funding source. And so you have to think about what are the, the problems that are, people are willing to pay for you to try to solve, which is unfortunate sometimes. Um, but also you have to think about where, you know, what are the uh, other trends like, you know, for example, right now we're in this kind of world of big data, right? You know, there are all these cheap sensors that are spewing out massive amounts of data. There are people at social media companies that are analyzing, you know, enormous amounts of activity 
and trying to apply algorithms to make sense out of that activity or make dollars out of that activity, if not sense. And so I think that that's also true in the analytical sciences that we're now in this time of big data. And I think really it's, you know, when I was a graduate student, it was in the 80s, it was just really the beginning of computational chemistry. I mean, they had been doing it before, but it was very hard to do. The computers were atrocious. Um, I mean, I, when I was an undergraduate, I didn't take a computer science class because they still used card punch. That's how long ago that was. But, um, but now, of course, computers are very cheap and very powerful, and we're all producing massive amounts of data. So this analysis, we've gone from just experiments and very simple algorithmic theories to experiments and also computationally developed work and now we also have this big data where we can kind of use software tools to dive into this data and to try to make, to discover new things from that, which is really a different paradigm than we've mostly dealt with. And some fields have already been there. The omics fields have been there for a while, but the other fields like material science is working very hard to catch up, for example. And it's something that I think it's going to impact all of us. But it's also very difficult because you don't have all the same issues in these different fields. And so, for example, you know, if you're running an X-ray photoelectron spectrum, you may run it under one set of conditions, and somebody else may run it under a different set of conditions. How do you compare those? You know, and making sense of that is hard. So it's, it's a challenge, I think. Um, kind of in that vein, I'm curious what you think, um, if graduate students need to have a certain, a different set of skills today than they did, 20 or 30 years ago, um, and, and do you see us getting those skills as, as we're going through our graduate programs? Um, yes and no. I think you do need more computational skills. I think people need to be at least aware of these big data strategies. Um, the catch is that, you know, on the one hand, if you work in a field where, you know, there's, you're using instrumentation, but it's all, you know, you're using a fully commercial instrument and all the tools they provide you, Oftentimes that can take you very far, but sometimes that all you run into barriers, and you need at least some people that know how that stuff works and know, okay, what are the details of that? And so I, I think that there's no there's no one set of skills for everybody these days. There's just too much. There's too much of everything, right? There are too many different skills you need. There's too much. There are too many papers published. You know, just in terms of keeping track. Um, so you're, we're all required to specialize. You know, there was this, this romantic notion of the Renaissance man, and back in the Renaissance, you know, one person could know a pretty significant fraction of all knowledge, and now, forget about it, right? There's never any chance of us being there again. So we just have to kind of, it's, it's kind of a moving target, I think, so. Uh, so I kind of have a chicken or the egg question uh, along the lines of your instrument development and and the need for funding. Uh, did you have an idea for instrument development and then you went in search of funding sources or did you find a problem and you realized that you have this particular specialty? I think there's a problem and I'm trying to solve it, but it's very biased by what I, I do and the way I do it. So I, so I think I'm always very influenced by the things that I have, I, hope I have talent in. Um, so for example, some years ago, I was working in biomaterials and we were, you know, there was a trend to do surface chemical modification of biomaterials and so there were some opportunities there and I looked at what some real leaders in the field were doing and I thought, you know, I can do this. And so I started to do this and I was doing some simple chemistry and I was doing mostly surface analysis on simple chemistry, but then, as I was doing this and I'd gotten funding for it and we were publishing papers, all of a sudden arriving in the field were all these really good chemists that were very good at synthetic chemistry and they were good at developing new synthetic chemistry methods for modifying surfaces and the tools that I was using were becoming more common and they were becoming easier to buy commercially. And at that point I decided I need to get out of this because I can no longer compete. These, these synthetic chemists are much better than me in synthetic chemistry, and they can do most, almost all the same things that I can do with the instruments in my lab, so what's my edge now? So I think it's always, but I've always had, uh, I've always, I've moved around a lot. My publication list is very diverse, which means that I'm, 
either my own version of a Renaissance man or I have attention deficit disorder. Um, so I, I just, that's the way I've operated and it has its pluses and its minuses. I mean, it gives you flexibility to go into new fields and it's interesting, you can learn a lot of stuff, but it's harder to impact one field be because I've been moving around a lot, so. Speaking of both funding and sort of changing around in fields a little bit, you were able to um, take advantage of the uh, NSF program rotator mm -hmm. um, opportunity. How did that opportunity come about and sort of what was the draw for you from a scientific aspect? Well, so the National Science Foundation, unlike most of the other funding agencies, has, has a regular and well-advertised program for bringing what they call rotators. So they bring in a couple dozen rotators every year across all the different disciplines that they fund, and they have a process to train people, bring them up to speed, and then they stay for one, two, or three years. Um, and so there was an ad for one of those in the chemistry division, which is one of the, is the division that's funded me the most out of NSF. And I looked at the ad and said, okay, I have some overlap with the skills of what they're looking for, and so I applied, and they interviewed me, and then I accepted, so. And it was also a time where I felt that I, um, it was something I was willing to pursue at that moment. Um, so it was very interesting to see how grants are given out. Um, there, it, there are, uh, I think that the NSF does a very good job at this. I think that they have a lot of challenges, and it's, I think some of those challenges are almost impossible to meet. I think there's, uh, you know, the biggest challenge is that there's a far more demand for NSF dollars than there are NSF dollars. And so how do you mediate that? And, yeah, so along those lines, um, with uh, only a certain amount of funding to um, give out and a very competitive um, pool of proposals, what is it, if there is a common thing that pushes over the very, very good that are um, funded and um, those that are close but didn't quite make it? I think it's a combination of good science, you know, a creative approach to solving problems, and also um, good communication. And also NSF, I don't think it's any secret that they're kind of the first source of funding for many people, and they are sometimes the only source of funding for certain scientists, and so they uh, tend to do better than people that are have multiple sources of funding because some of the reviewers can always say, well, you know, they, is this work going to get done if NSF doesn't fund it? And if the answer is yes, then they're less likely to give it a, a high review. Uh, but it's, it's very dependent upon the review panels. Also, the review panels have a lot of young people on them. A lot of senior people, you know, it's some of the other funding agencies, they tend to they have mechanisms where they are funding people over a longer period of time, and they, they have things like at NIH, they have study sections, and to get to become a permanent member of a study section, you have to achieve a certain level of prominence. And so they tend to wind up with more established investigators. But then those established investigators are being called upon by those agencies to review, and so they, won't, they don't have the time or to come to NSF. And so, NSF will often reach out to a broader range of people and will bring in oftentimes actually quite young people to review, which I think is healthy, um, though it does sometimes create some issues um, in terms of kind of understanding the, the background of a field and so forth. Thank you. Writing is really important. Yeah. Writing, you just like communication, I mean, my, my cynical comment is you write your proposals as though your reviewer is half asleep. You know, because they all have a lot to do and they don't always have, some of them do a fabulous job of picking through the details and some of them they just don't have the time um, in, or for whatever reason to pay close enough attention and it's easy to miss things. So I'm just wondering how has being a member of the American Vacuum Society specifically influenced your career growth and um, do you see any benefits with being in AVS as compared to some other professional societies? Um, so I've long been a member of AVS, ACS, and the American Society of Mass Spectrometry. Um, and um, AVS is really my favorite because the conferences aren't too big and they're scientifically the most diverse. And also I've kind of developed a community there. So I, when I go, I always meet people I know and I can socialize and network and so forth. Um, 
and I feel like there's a better chance of kind of learning something new for me. Uh, ACS meetings, I find a little overwhelming. Uh, the, I mean, different disciplines, they have their own meetings. And so this, the kind of quote unquote chemistry that I do, it's not as well covered at the ACS and the meetings are bigger. And so I've, I've gone to far fewer ACS meetings as a result. Um, and uh, American Society of Mass Spectrometry meetings are very big, but they're also very focused on particular topics and the sessions are very large. And it's, it's, I've always found it a little hard to kind of break into that community, even though I've been sort of hanging around it for a long time. So I, I like the AVS from that perspective. It's the, it's the one meeting I've gone to more than any other society. I think I've, in 29 years, I've probably been to something on the order of 20 of them. I don't know the exact number of the national symposia. So you touched on big data earlier and also discussed some limitations with spot size um, imaging using mass spec. Um, how do you envision the future of imaging with mass spec? Um, um, I think it's going to move into kind of a standard tool that it gives you a high level of chemical information. So in that sense, it's powerful. I don't know how you know, some imaging modalities can go to very small sizes, right? Electron microscopy goes down to the atomic, you know, tunneling microscopies go to the atomic level. I don't think mass spectro, you know, mass spec imaging is ever going to get there. It's just there are not enough molecules. Um, but it, I, I tend to think it, it's going to be hard to move beyond about, you know, tens of nanometers range. Um, the other issue is that some of the instruments are, are becoming so expensive that I don't know you know, the less expensive alternatives will, you know, create options for people. So I think it's still kind of an open question. Um, it also, you know, some of this has to do with what instruments become commercialized, right? So, and that's something that, you know, any successful analytical technique, eventually you, somebody has to be able to buy this thing and use it. So if you look at like the atom probe tomography, this is an instrument that frankly, if you know, when I first heard about it, you know, a decade or so ago, my initial thought was, boy, this is never going to be useful. You know, it's just going to be, even if it's useful, it's just going to be something that, you know, three people around the world use. And now they're selling these things. They've sold, you know, 100 plus of them from one company alone, and they are being fairly widely used and embraced. And so it's just a matter of that whole process of kind of developing. It's not just that you make an instrument, it's, it's the whole process of how do you prepare the samples, how do you analyze the data, you know, how hard is it to do that, who's going to do that, who's going to get access to the instrument, all of that you know, becomes important. And I think that's still to be seen how that's going to pan out in mass spectrometry imaging. Um, with follow-up for that, uh, do you ever see the miniaturization of these coming to be? Well, there's a lot of work on mi miniaturization of mass spectrometry, and that is a, there's a potential for that. Um, so in mass spec, one, one aspect is to go, it's, it's really arrived at high mass resolution and accuracy, which gives you very high chemical specificity and also doing things like, you know, tandem mass spectrometry to identify species further. And that's become a standard and that has, that's now coming into mass spec imaging more and more. Um, it's very hard, it's harder to do that on miniature instruments. And so the miniature instruments then become a, you need to have an application for them. And so in imaging, there are a few companies that are developing uh, miniature instruments. And it's, again, it's, you know, I, I think it's possible, but it's also something that you, know, you just have to kind of see where things go. Because, you know, technologies, people make selections about technology. You could say that our energy space, the fact that we're so fossil fuel based, was, was a technological selection a long time ago. Wind power, and solar power could have been where it is today, maybe not 10 years ago, but maybe, right? Because there weren't, I mean, how many fundamental new advances went into those technologies? Really, most of that was, I mean, there's been a lot of research into fundamental issues regarding them, but, you know, the, the basic technology that, technologies that are most widely used, they were already around 20 years ago. So, um, I might be wrong about magnets for the, wind power, but I, I think for solar power, look, it's still silicon solar cells, right? And they engineered it and, you know, they, they've gotten very inexpensive. 
So I think that's true with a lot of areas that you see that people have, they, you know, one technological area, it's not just, the analogy I like to use, which I can now no longer use because nobody knows what I'm talking about, is there used to be a thing called a reel-to-reel -reel tape, right? And a reel-to-reel -reel tape deck, you might see them in movies sometimes. They had two giant reels of magnetic tape, and this is what they used for studio recording of music and sound and so forth. And then Sony in the 80s, they figured out how to convert that into a Walkman, which is a little tiny cassette player, but then it was also, the player itself was very tiny, and you, know, you hang off your waist, you could play one tape. And that cost Sony an enormous amount of money to do that. But the technology wasn't, there wasn't much, if any, fundamental new scientific advance to get that. So I think that's true with any analytical instrumentation is that people need, you know, you have to get that refinement of, of the tool. And the more you refine it, the more people can use it, the more the user base is, and, you know, if it's useful, then the greater it grows unless something come along, comes along and replaces it, so. I was wondering if you could share some things about your time being a professor and like advisor and all these other roles you've taken at once. Um, I've enjoyed working with students. I, I, uh, I, like, I, I like the the ability to kind of develop an idea. And so I have, you know, sometimes I, you know, I feel like, you know, you can have, everyone has, we have our, you know, our, personal opinions about things and so forth and what we like and we don't like. And so you can kind of use that in terms of what you choose to work on. And so, for example, I, I choose to work on microbial, uh, you know, my, microbial biofilms because I think this is a, an exciting area that hasn't had enough attention. Um, and I also like, you know, I like the idea of working with students and giving them, you know, a project that they can bring to fruition. And I always try to make sure that they do have a particular set of skills that's useful for them. I try to make sure that they also are good at presenting and they can do some writing. You know, I always write papers with them, you know, which go goes through a, a process from when they start to when they end. So the idea is by the time they get their PhD, they, they are pretty good writers to very good writers. Um, so I enjoy that whole process. Uh, I, I don't mind writing grants. I don't like getting grants rejected. Nobody does, but you know, it's just kind of the business. You have to have a thick skin. And I think that uh, if I had advice to anybody now, I would say you just have to have a really thick skin because they're, you know, the, the scientific funding enterprise everywhere is, there's not as much money as there are you know, as there is the ability of competent scientists to spend that money. So, and scientists, you know, we're good at, you know, coming up with expensive stuff to do. So that's, you know, it, you know, if someone came to you tomorrow and said, I'll give you $10 million to do something, you'd figure out how to spend it, right? Um, whether or not that was the best use of the $10 million is another story, but, uh, you know, um, but I, it's been an interesting process. I get, you know, if there's something I'm not, that thrilled with, I don't have to work in it. So I also enjoy that. And I think that's a great flexibility of you know, academic science, is this ability to kind of explore new ideas. Uh, I try to keep in touch with what goes on in the world so it doesn't wander off too far into what my own PhD advisor referred to once as stamp collecting. You know, it's kind of studying obscure little phenomena that don't, aren't maybe so important. Um, I think the funding agencies do a pretty good job of keeping people away from that stuff because they're under a lot of pressure to, to do useful things and to show that they're not just funding minutia, but they're funding you know, important issues and solving problems. So sometimes maybe a little bit more than makes sense. You know, sometimes I think we need a little more fundamental science, but you know, we live in a political world and that's what we have to work with. So. Kind of on the same lines, was there anything about academics that stuck out to you over government or industry, and why did you go into this field instead? Um, of I had seen a lot of, uh, 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 being in the business world, I grew up in a, uh, in a bedroom community of New York where almost all the people, you know, this was the 70s, and so they were mostly men, so I'm not trying to be sexist by saying this, most of the men who went off to work were, you know, they were working in the private sector and oftentimes in fairly lucrative industries, but also the turnover in those jobs was really kind of high. And 
none of that really appealed to me. I wanted to do something that was a little more intellectual. And uh, um, the, the academic environment appealed to me because there is a stability to the academic environment. Um, you know, we complain about grants, but the mechanism, the way a research university works is really a powerful structure because you, you know, even if, you know, if you're generally successful, but you lose one grant for a little bit, you can replace it with another one. Maybe the student teaches a little bit, they can still get their PhD, you can still work on this, and you, can, you still have a second chance. That's not true for a lot of areas. You know, if a company is investing in some technology, and they think they're gonna do this, sometimes you know, they make a business decision that says, okay, we're not gonna do this anymore. And then that can be very disruptive to the people who are working on it. And I wasn't quite willing to have to have that disruption occur upon me because I had seen it inflicted upon people when I was growing up and it was rather difficult. So I guess that's counter to the whole notion of the, the fierce entrepreneur. Um, but um, you know, a lot of things that entrepreneurs develop, they are they're ideas that have really been proven. Right? They haven't been proven they can make money or that they could be something that, that, that work well enough that they could be in greater use, but fundamentally they've been proven. And that's a lot of what we do in university is we fundamentally prove that something, things can work, that it's possible to do them. So like here at the School of Mines, there's a, there's a lot of very impressive research on renewable energy technologies. And whether it's fuel cells uh, or batteries uh, and you know, most of these won't work well enough. The vast majority of them won't work well enough. But some of them might wind up being the engine of, you know, the economy in the future. And companies don't work on this side of it. It's, I'm not trying to say bad things about companies. They have their own bottom line and their own needs and their own goals and they're, you know, you know they are often and usually really good at the things that they do. But that's their role and this is our role and you know when we interact with them we can also do great things but I think that that was one of the appeals for me to be in academia as that freedom and I, I've uh, I think I've actually you know I think that's been borne out even over 30 years and all the various changes so. Um, so I kind of have a follow up a little bit on a different thread but um when you first decided to apply to be a professor mm -hmm. and you had to come up with your research program mm -hmm. as part of the you know hiring process. Um, how did you come up with that research plan? Did that feed off of any of your graduate work or postdoc work, or did, did that kind of inspire you to start your own research program? It did. So I'm a great believer in literature, and I started reading very extensively. I was working in eye molecule reactions in the gas phase, so we were working um, with studying clusters. It was kind of the early, early times in nanoscience before people were making, you know, they were so good at making so many different nanoparticles as before C60 had been synthesized as you know bulk form, um, and even before C60 had been identified as an interesting uh, species, even in the gas phase. And so, and then I went to work in a surface science group, and so I started looking for things that were kind of at the interfaces. And I discovered this field of secondary ion mass spectrometry. So, so I started reading and reading in secondary ion mass spectrometry, and I started reading. Uh, the literature of ion surface interactions, and from that I developed some ideas. Um, and that kind of led to the first big project that I worked on. And actually the thing that I proposed on uh, was studying mechanisms of secondary ion mass spectrometry, but then when I arrived I discovered there was this other method that was potentially useful, which was bouncing ions off of surfaces. And so I started working in that field, and that's basically what got me tenure, was that work. It was in what was known as surface-induced association, which never really caught on because it was solving a problem in mass spectrometry that was solved a different way. And that other way is the way that everybody does it now. But that, now people do a little bit of it. But So then that's, that kind of led me to looking at different ideas. Um, and I'm always, I've always been tending to look at kind of trying to work into new areas. Because one thing too is that you know, you, you're competing with this world and it's not just your smarts, it's what are your resources. You know, if, you know, can, can you, uh, you can compete on a new idea. It's harder to compete if it's everyone knows what this was. And when, when I was in a graduate study in this field of gas phase clusters, I remember going to a Gordon conference. My advisor was really great about letting me, uh, taking us to Gordon conferences. And 
I remember going around to the meeting and, you know, Gordon conferences are great because they're small and you can meet people and, you know, and talk to them. And I kept hearing the same few ideas in cluster science because everyone had kind of figured out at that point in time what you could and could not do. And so they were exploring that and discussing it. And as I heard that, I was like, I can't, I don't see how I, as a new assistant professor, I'm going to be able to beat these other groups that are better established, that know how to do these things better than I do. And so I decided to get out of that field. Now, I then returned back to cluster science many years later and worked in it for a little bit. But, uh, you know, I think it's this constant examination of the literature, what's out there, and, you know, kind of a consideration, kind of a cold eye of what can you do? You know, how do you, you know, and are you really going to be able to do this thing that you're hoping to do, and will someone else be able to do it before you or garner the resources? Because you have to, you know, you know, you're trying to convince someone to give you, you know, your typical NSF grant, it took 10 taxpayers to fund that, okay? So, yeah, that's, those are very, these are very precious dollars that we spend, and so they're not surprisingly hard to get. You know, most people who live in this country or any other country that funds research in a similar way that the U.S. does, uh, you know, they don't get that benefit of government largesse. And so it's, by definition, it's hard to achieve that. And so you, when you convince people that, you know, you're doing something new and this is creative and it hasn't been, it's a field that hasn't been plowed before, then you have a hope of convincing them. So... So coming back to being a developer of instruments, what does your research group look like? And are they all primarily chemistry majors? And if so, how do they do with the engineering aspects and some of the big data aspects? I know you collaborate um, with big data. Scientists. I have a senior scientist who's a, two se well, all of one senior scientist and part of another one who also has a university duty um, outside of my group. And they're both actually, uh, trained as physicists. Uh, one was trained in uh, ion optics uh, quite extensively. Um, and then all my graduate students are chemistry majors, but I, the, one of the first things I tell them is that we're not really doing what's traditionally considered chemistry. So they have to learn that stuff. Sometimes they know it, uh, but sometimes they have to learn it. And I would take students from other disciplines, uh, but it's just my university is not set up those mechanisms terribly well in other places. It sounds like here at the School of Mines, you guys have a pretty good system for that. I think that's a very, and I've heard of other universities who have that, and I think that's a very attractive option, because oftentimes we do need people with different skills, and so in my case, they have to just kind of learn them from scratch, and there's a certain amount of induction time until they get good at that. Do you ever feel like you are straying too far from chemistry in this, in this development phase, or do you always... Or are there times where you kind of have to bring things back home and say, you know, we're really trying to look at these chemistries and we're developing the tool to do it? Oh, no, I don't care. I just, you know, <laughs> if, if, uh, you know, the hardest thing about being in this business is, is getting funding. And so if you get funding, then you've already been reviewed and you've convinced someone to get this going. And then it's a question of, you know, you're always being checked, right? You... You have to get the funding to do this. You have to get hi first of all, you get hired, and you have to get enough resources when you're hired to get going. You have to get uh, then you have to start publishing. You then have to get funding. You know, and you're always convincing people. When you, you submit a paper, you have to convince the reviewers that this is worthwhile. You know, so on and so forth. So, I don't worry so much. I think it's a very multidisciplinary world, and chemistry, frankly, has a long history of kind of, you know, expanding to claim that it covers other fields. So I think this is, and other fields are now have learned this trick and they're kind of expanding a little bit over what chemistry does. So I, I think it's, it, you know, it, I think the idea of a chemistry department makes sense from teaching. Um, but I think, you know, in terms of research, it makes sense to just interact with the people that you interact with. And that's actually what I like about the AVS is the diversity of the backgrounds of the scientists at it is quite broad. And so you get, you get that kind of, that sort of information and that, that multidisciplinary input. So. Uh, do you work much with uh, users of, of your technology and then kind of educating and, and developing uh, other people's skill sets to make use of it? Or I have some. Um, I, I might be a little too quick to move on to something else, though. So I think... 
I'm at the stage of my career that I sort of have to stick with what I'm doing now. So that's my goal. But I, so I haven't, but I've seen people, to, the people that are really are the most successful developing methods, some of them move around, and, but some of them also just stick with one method and they just really uh, pound on that. So, you know, and, so that, and that's worked for them. So we're nearing the end of our time. Are there any last minute questions or? So if there aren't, oh, do you want to ask a question, Gordon? And then we'll wrap up. So what in your personal and or professional um, experiences has motivated you throughout your career and continues to motivate you? Um, I like that, I like being in the university, and specifically in a state university, because we take people from a lot of different backgrounds, especially people who's, you know, they may be the first member of their family to go to university or college, and we train them to a, a high level. And we, uh, we bring them to the point where they can now compete and function in, you know, you know our modern knowledge-based economy. So that's very motivating to me. Um, I just like science. I like I, you know, I like the idea of being able to, you know, develop a new idea and see if it works. I even came up with one recently. I don't know if it's going to work, but I'm, I'm like, I can't wait until I can try it. I don't know. We don't quite have enough money to fund it. So I asked for the money to fund it. I'm trying to figure out, well, if I can't pay for that, for the money I have, am I going to try to somehow do it anyway, or am I going to wait? What am I going to do if I don't have enough money and the grant doesn't fund? So, because I think it's, it's worth pursuing it. It's a good idea. So that, that whole process is very rewarding. You know, it's much in the same way that you know, if you were a you know, musician. When I was young, I was a musician. I was not a very good musician, but I found it very satisfying. Every now and then I'd play well, rarely. But, and so it's the same sort of, you know, this you know, satisfaction of creative, creativity. Um, and, you know, I, I like universities as structures. They have a lot of flaws, but I think that they are, you know, they're kind of, you know, the world has a lot of problems, right? And, Universities are people, this is where you can solve some of them, or at least begin to solve some of them, right? So we see this, this whole issue of global warming. It's not, it's going to be solved with a lot of it with technology. Fine, there's a lot of development of kind of changing people's opinions and so forth, but, you know, we, you know, we have to understand the world around us, you know, and that's something that, I think you know the university is the place where that happens, and it sometimes happens in very unexpected places. So, and I don't want to just be come off like I'm very biased towards science and engineering, because sometimes you'll have someone from the humanities, social sciences, who will come up with something, you know, the way of ex you know expressing something, or you know, an understanding of human behavior that speaks to the way um, you know a problem can or will be difficult to solve. And I think those are all issues that you know the university is ideally suited. To solve, so I'm a really a great believer in universities, but maybe not so much in the traditional, uh, you know, ivory tower sense of you know whatever the academic does is by definition worth doing. So you have to kind of see out into the world and try to impact that. And you know, by and large, that's what I've seen in my career is people want to have that impact. You know, they want to try to do uh, to make things better. You know, even when it's not clear that, you know, society recognizes that that's something that has to be done. So. Well, thank you so much to everyone who asked questions today. And let's give one more uh, round of applause and thanks to Dr. Hanley for being here with us. And thank you. Thank you.